In this lecture, we're going to cover the basics of a CFA and get into making latent variable models instead of just path analysis. And so I made this picture not because it's like the best representation of how all these statistics relate to each other, especially mathematically, but it kind of like groups them together in ways that kind of theoretically make sense. So let's look over here on the right side. Uh, we've been working on path analysis, which we said was just multiple regression on steroids. And multiple regression with one X and one Y is a correlation. And ANOVA and T-tests are mathematically equivalent to a regression analysis. And so this whole side just represents the sort of regression framework. Now, the middle here represents our more latent variable framework, where we have exploratory factor analysis that we started with this semester to think about like how we might begin to understand how items relate to a latent variable. The confirmatory half of that type of analysis now, I don't maybe shouldn't have IRT nested here under CFA because it's definitely a different type of math, but um, IRTs can be similar to EFA if uh, the EFA is on completely categorical data, but it's really kind of meant to represent this sort of development and thinking about how items relate to their latent variables. And we'll talk when we get to IRT about the, the test, the um, framework thinking about test theory. And the one other type of analysis that I think is definitely a losing favor, but is still an interesting one to me, is sort of these traditional multivariate analyses. So things like um, ANOVA, right? and specifically canonical correlation. So CANCOR, as it's kind of colloquially called, is really just a, a special type of CFA because people are trying to relate their they're measured variables to uh, latent variables and correlate those latent variables. And so it's just a, like a special instance. So if you ever see canonical correlation, you can kind of think about it in a similar fashion to CFA after you're done with this lecture. We're most gonna spend most of our time relating this to EFA because that's kind of um, the most obvious link. And so remember in our EFA, we might have this a bunch of items or a bunch of questions, or a bunch of stuff, measured variables. And we have an idea, or sometimes not, how many different latent variables or factors we might expect. And in the EFA, we let the questions or items do whatever they want. So I'm gonna to continue to talk about this as a survey development framework. But remember, when I say question, it could be literally any item that you're interested in. And you just let them correlate how they're gonna. And then we remove these bad questions or these bad items until we get simple structure and a good fitting model. Okay. Well, in a CFA, we're going to do the confirmatory half. We set up that model with specific items onto specific factors because we know that this measurement should relate to this latent variable. Now, in EFA, you might have tried to design it that way, but I know I talked about my um, project that it took five tries before we got it right. But in the CFA framework, you don't let them do whatever you want. You set them specifically to their specific latent variables. And that means that we're forcing those cross loadings to zero. So this brings back me back to simple structure where we're often saying it only relates to this variable. And that's one reason why you might try to select items that don't cross load. Now, can I put a manifest variable that measures to that is measured by two different latent variables? Yep, you can. So cross loadings aren't bad. It just makes the interpretation more difficult. And then we'll test if that model fits. So we might think about how confirmatory factor analysis is sort of step two to the exploratory factor analysis. And this is how a lot of measurement skills get developed, for better or worse. Now we're going to talk about two types of models and then mostly only do one of them, but I think it's helpful to know these different names. So a reflective model is where the latent variables are reflected through those measured variable scores. So we think that the latent variables cause those manifest variable scores. This is how EFA works as well. And it's essentially this idea that, that you can't directly measure the latent variable, but it is reflected through the answers on these items. 
That's how I remember it. The purpose is to understand the relationships between these measured variables because they're all caused by the selection variable. That's the same theoretical concept as EFA. This is the most common way to set up one of these types of models. I just want to walk you through an example here, and we'll get way more de deep into the, the code itself. But um, this is the like default example, actually, for Levon's CFA function. And so there's a famous um, Holzinger-Swineford model, and it's sort of meant to represent three different factors, visual, textual, and speed factors, as measured or indicated by um, Six, nine different scales. We'll talk a lot more about this equals tilde in a little bit. We would fit our model. So build the model, fit the model. I'm going to skip the analyze, the, the summarize the model part here just to really talk about this reflective example. And I do the diagram here. Okay. So reflective models are ones where the latent variable is the exogenous variable, right? Exiting the variable. And the manifest variables are the endogenous variables, so the arrows go from the latent to the measured variables. And so this is your very traditional CFA. So it's got three latent variables and nine measured variables. Now the other way that you can do this is called a formative model, where the latent variables are the result or combination of the manifest variables. And this is more similar to a principal components uh, analysis in the theoretical concept. And potentially, I feel like this is a place that you might use it in, in a demographics sense, right? So there's not some inherent genetic or thing about me that you know caused me to be grown grow up in the southern U.S. with a specific socioeconomic status, being a woman and left-handed, right? Those those are things that are true about me, but they don't they're not caused by any like one latent factor. However, I could build a profile of our participants in our study, for example, using some of those variables. And so we would create a latent variable that sort of represents the different profiles, the best word I can come up with, of the participants in the study. And that's just one idea I've had. There are other places and where you might entertain this idea of a formative indicator. Uh, we'll do one more example a little bit later where you're building uh, the latent variable from the manifest variables. Now, this does not run very well because I don't really have a good example, but so you'll see here like, ah, I don't like this. <laughs> the model's not identified. But I will point out that the code here is this sort of backwards pointy squiggle arrow uh, where we're setting visual to be comprised of these other three uh, measured variables. Okay. Now, it also is useful to show you that it does spit out a bunch of warnings when things are wrong. So keep an eye out for these sort of things. It's very easy in Levon, I have done this, where you just like are telling it to run the whole code set and the Levon output is so long, you miss the fact that it threw an error message. Okay. I just want to show you how it looks when you print one of these out, right? It actually does not print the arrow, and I, I, I think that's just how Sympaths is. But the arrow will be going from X1 to visual here. So it doesn't like that very much. And a quick reminder that all our exogenous variables, only variables, get those covariances. And so that's part of the reason why this is particularly unhappy is because I, you know, I don't have a marker variable here. And um, which I would have to set manually, and I have a lot of almost too many paths. But that is the difference between a reflexive and a formative indicator. Okay, we're mostly going to do reflexive indicators. Now, um, manifest variables in a CFA are sometimes called indicator variables. This gets so confusing, the language here. So they, they're measured variables because they're measured in your data set. They're manifest variables and they're indicator variables. You can call them items or questionnaires. So there are a lot of names here. I just would like to at least mention this fact so you're not like, what is this new fancy variable thing? All the same idea, the squares in our model. And the reason they get this slightly different name is because they indicate the latent variable, because we can't directly measure a latent variable, that's the point, 
Um, but what we're saying is the latent variable is the cause for the behavioral output that we see on these measured variables. Now, I am still a social scientist on a good day. So it could be uh, the computer output that you see. <laughs> it doesn't have to be behavioral. I just think about participants as people. All right, so how do I set this up? Well, generally, if you have more than one latent variable, those things will be correlated. And that happens for you automatically in Levon because remember the exogenous only variables are all correlated with each other. Talked about that in path analysis as a sort of surprise. And in path analysis, we did not see that as part of the output. We run a summary, it's hidden from you. It's like hard to calculate the degrees of freedom because those are in the background. Now they show up on Simplot, which is really nice. <laughs> Here, these are part of the main model, and so you'll see them under the covariances section. And that is similar in EFA to an oblique rotation. Okay, so that's one reason why we make this reference. So remember that oblique allows them to be correlated with each other because if you have two latent variables on the same scale, for, for example, why would they be uncorrelated? Why would you have them on the same scale? <laughs> so. Generally, we expect some of these things to be correlated. However, you can force them to be uncorrelated by setting it to zero. So we can actually test that theory of if they're correlated or not. Each of the factor sections has to be identified. So each latent variable section, each little measure, mini measurement model. And we'll talk about how you can do that in a minute. And a brief summary, you need at least three measure variables per latent to have a better slide here to see. If I only have two, you will need to set their coefficients to be equal. Now, this means estimated. It doesn't mean set them both to two or something. It just means set them equal to each other. So you would normally estimate two, but instead you're only estimating one, and they both get that path <clears throat> coefficient. And we're going to do this as a reflexive model where the arrows go from the latent to the measured variables. The latent variable is exogenous. The measured variable is endogenous. Practically, what that means is the latent variable is x, the measure variable is y. Because we think the latent variable caused those measured answers. Okay. This does not make the model causal, but the predict, we have predicted a direction. And the other thing we'll add is that there are error terms in all of our measured variables, and variances on our latent variables very practically. It doesn't really matter. Each box or circle gets uh, some form of variance. Our measured variables are the ones that get the error terms, which have a dot in front of them, and the output, and the latent variables get variances, which don't have the dot. And that's not because they're error um, measured and, and latent, that's because of um, endogenous and exogenous. And that helps you if you're trying to count de degrees of freedom. So if you're trying to figure out where, why you got an identification error, this is a good place to, to start <laughs> because it's easy to forget about those error variances. Now, here's an interesting concept we're going to test. And generally, we're going to leave those error terms uncorrelated right? because each item is a separate thing. It's predicted by the latent variable, but each item is a different component maybe, of that latent variable, a different piece of the latent variable. And obviously they overlap or this they wouldn't correlate with each other. However, all of these items might measure that same factor. So um, as an example of a, a project I'm actually currently working on, we're trying to develop a, a survey instrument for patients with migraine that measures uh, their response to treatment. So, you know, we have questions like, my head pain has decreased and I have fewer migraine days. Those are different ways to ask about the same thing, but the number of headaches or the pain of the headaches, right? And often they can be pretty similar, right? So I think it's actually, I think my number of head pain days has decreased or, and then I have less, fewer migraine days. Okay. Those are slightly different items, but they're, at their core, asking different, th asking very similar things about the number of days that are bad, right? And their items, <clears throat> their answers on these items are probably going to be pretty similar. 
And one solution would be to drop one of the items if you think they're too highly correlated. They're not quite measuring the same thing. So it's head pain days and migraine days, sometimes different things. You know, if you think it's a headache or a migraine. And so it's not too big of a leap to say that those items errors might be related because they're going to have very similar answers. And so the error term, if you put a four on one, you're likely going to put a four or five on the other, that kind of thing. The other example I have is from a, a, a couple of other scales that we've worked with in the past. And one of them is particularly funny. It's this idea, this scale that I no longer use that uh, the very first question is, I do drugs or alcohol, <laughs> or I do drugs. Let's stick with the drugs. And so it's like a yes or no. Okay, great. People mark no. Okay. Then the very next question is, I can quit drugs when I want to. I can't tell you the number of freshmen in our studies that didn't know what to do because, you know, if you wrote no on the first one, what are you supposed to write on the second one? So I can quit drugs if I want to. Well, you want to say yes, because I can, because I don't do drugs. But then it looks like maybe you've lied on the first one. And then on the second one, I guess you should put no, because you aren't doing drugs. So of course you can quit. But then it looks weird to say no, because you said you haven't done drugs. <laughs> and so a lot of people left it blank. So this is a missing, not at random kind of problem. And a lot of people wrote MA out to the side. And we finally just ditched the scale and picked a different one. Um, so those two items, error terms, are related <laughs> because the response to one of them is uh, tied to the second one. Uh, one more example, because on that scale, you should just redesign the scale. But on, on another scale, we have sometimes what's called reactivity. And I've actually written a paper on this and didn't find any reactivity, um, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. So, like, if we have we have this meaning in life scale that's like, I know my life's purpose, I find my life meaningful, blah blah blah. They're all happy, meaning-related items about one's purpose, and then they're like, you tootle along and you get to this item that's like, I often think of suicide or. Something. And it's a shock to people because they're like, yay, happy, happy, happy. Oh, oh. Right. So the response to one set of those items can be then affected by that sudden change in tone in the scale. So not a leap to say that the error terms on items can be related. Okay. Just thinking about it because they're very similar or because of the way that the participant interacts with, with taking items. Now, that's specific to questionnaires. I am positive there are ways that things are related in other um, areas of study. Um, I just am really good at questionnaires. <laughs> so it's not too surprising that we might think that two items have this kind of autocorrelation is what it's called, where their error terms are not independent anymore because of however the data is acquired. And modification indices is a way for us to see this because modification indices will show me what items, where the misfit in the model is. More on those later. The biggest key I would say is that it's very easy and tempting to try to build a good fitting model by adding whatever modification indices make the model better. In and instead, I would tell you to focus on what makes sense, because a good fitting model may not predict anything, especially if you are adding things that just mathematically make the model better and theoretically or practically for your business don't make any sense. Okay, so always make sure it makes sense. The interpretation of a CFA is um, a little different. So we've been looking at the regression section of the model. Instead, now we're going to have a section called factor loadings. Okay, so when we say loadings, we're referring to it in the same way that we did for EFA. Okay, we can still think of these as coefficients right, because they're the relationship of um, the latent variable predicting the manifest measured variable. But since I'm relating this to factor analysis, it's called confirmatory factor analysis. We're going to call mostly call them factor loadings. And that's the relationship, like I said, of the latent variable predicting the 
manifest variable. And so we want that relationship to be strong. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit about the standardized solution uh, here in a minute so that we can understand what strong means. And we used a rule before of 0.3, but if you're going to continue to use that rule, which is fine, make sure you look at the standardized solution and not the unstandardized solution because the unstandardized solution is in the scale of the data and that 0.3 doesn't mean anything. In the standardized, completely standardized solution that now has the same scale that that 0.3 rule is based on. And if it doesn't load on the latent variable, why would we continue to use this item? And so if an item suddenly comes up and it's just not related to this latent variable, why is it there? What is it doing? What's wrong with it? <laughs> especially if our EFA worked. And so this confirmatory thing could point out, you know, non-generalization of the model to a new sample. Um, it's kind of like cross-fold in the sense that we want the model to replicate. And if the item doesn't load onto the latent variable or have a, a strong path coefficient, or loading, factor loading, then something's wrong. And the coefficients actually break down, uh, this is more of a relationship back to EFA, but they break down into kind of two names. In an EFA, we didn't really do this in our lecture, but some people talk about these, is the pattern coefficients, that's the unstandardized solution. And the way you interpret that is for every one unit in increase in the latent variable, there are B unit increases in the manifest variable. So if the pattern coefficient is 1.5, the unstandardized coefficient, that means for every one unit increase in the latent variable, I get 1.5 points on this manifest scale. And those are useful for understanding in the scale of the data, if that's important. More often than not, you look at the structure coefficients, however. So this is the standardized solution. And that's basically the correlation between the latent variable and the manifest variable. This is the one where I can interpret the 0.3 rule. But the interpretation is, um, you know, for every one standard deviation increase in latent variable, we get the standard deviation increases in the manifest variable. That's very like tricky to think about. So instead, just think about them as correlation because they do have the correlation scale. All right, well, it's middle of the afternoon. It's much easier to be awake at 8.30 when I normally do this, but identification rules of thumb, I'll try not to yawn too much. Um, what are the rules here? So if I'm building a latent model with a latent variable, right, uh, what should I do? Well, that latent variable should have at least four indicators. So circling back to my EFA lecture, I said that latent variables should have at least three or four items that load. And here's the reason why, because it should have at least four indicators for identification purposes. And now hopefully this makes sense. And latent variables also could have three indicators, but don't vary any of their error variances or vary. It can actually also have two, but no more error variances co-varying and the loadings are set equal to each other. This just allows you to have enough degrees of freedom. Now, scaling. So remember that scaling part of identification as well, but um, it's the way that we set the scale for the latent variable. And we usually do this by allowing Levon to set a marker variable where one of those pattern coefficients is set to one. So this is why I wanted to talk about pattern. Um, this is the unstandardized solution. Another option is to set the variance of the latent variable to one. These are ones here in this weird font. And on our summarized outputs, scd.levon or standardized.levon is that approach where we've set the variance of the latent variable to one. And that sets that scale to a z score. And so that's nice because z scores are interpretable, right? They're in standard deviation units. And that means that now our um, relationship between latents is a correlation. Um, that is way more way more, easier, really, much more like all the adverbs here. Um, that is a simpler interpretation than covariance. But make sure you're using unstandardized data, because if you try to ask for the standardized solution on 
standardized data, it um, doesn't make any sense. And the one will actually not do this if you give it a correlation matrix. You'll see. Now, in our output, we've also seen the standardized all. And I've talked about this as the completely standardized solution, using a quote here. And so we've got pattern coefficients, right? The unstandardized solution, standardized on the latent variable. What makes it completely standardized? That's when both the latent variable variance and the manifest variable variance are set to one. And that's really nice because now the latent variables and the manifest variables have the same scale. And so generally people report this. That's why in our um, uh, sim plots, you'll mostly see me tell you to ask for the standardized solution. This is the most common thing, and it matches EFA and a standardized regression. Not regular regression, but like beta in regression. Now, all of these options give you different loadings, but they don't change model fit because they all print out in the main summary. And so <clears throat> just some examples that we're going to do to look at CFA here. And a quick reminder. If you input a correlation matrix, your solution is already standardized. And so it will, you know, it, Levon will know this because it has one stem, the diagonal, which makes a correlation matrix instead of variance or covariance matrix. And if you ask for the standardized solution, it'll just print the same one like three times because you can't double standardize basically. If you import a covariance matrix, you can use both the unstandardized and standardized solution. And then one more time from back, <laughs> I use a lot of um, examples that allow us to input covariance correlation matrices because they're from books and that's how the book gives you the data. If you have the raw data, use the raw data, just input the data and you'll see those in our examples. Um, the practice examples that are part of this package. If all you have is a covariance matrix from, let's say, a publication, input that. And if all you have is a correlation matrix, you can input that. And so the order of usefulness is raw data followed by covariance followed by correlation. The reason that we um, are inputting correlation matrix is not because that's the only way, it's because that's the only version of the data that we have. I get this question a lot. Let's start simple with one latent variable. And we're going to use IQ. Now, I'm kind of over IQ at this point, but it's a very easy example. Right, so IQ intelligence quotient um, is this idea, this G, this overall cognitive ability, right? That we, you know, people vary in their cognitive abilities, and we can argue all day about what actually IQ measures. But just roll with me here on this idea that we have different levels of cognitive ability. Right? And so I can use the latent variable to measure these different levels through some output. And I'm specifically going to use an example because I have the data of the WISC. The WISC is the Wexler Intelligence Scale for Children. They also have an adult version called the WACE. And I have some example data from an old version of the test that has five subtest scores, uh, information similarities, word reasoning, matrix reasoning, and picture concept. Information is like basic facts, similarities, compare this to that, reasonings, um, and then picture concepts, uh, which is relating pictures to each other or like, a, like, like pictures in a story and put in the new picture, depending on which one it is. Now this particular example I have a correlation matrix that I'm going to convert into a covariance matrix. And so many times what you get in a research publication is this correlation matrix where they just dump everything in. I actually recently either published one or was a reviewer on one that I didn't, that basically was like always include a correlation matrix if you have a sim model because then people can replicate your work. I agree with this statement. Now sometimes they'll also give you the standard deviations. So if you have both of those, you can get back to a covariance matrix, which will allow you to look at these standardized and unstandardized solutions. 
So you'd enter this correlation matrix. So we're going to use matrix lower to full. I've got my standard deviations for these. You can tell this is made up data. Uh, okay, then we're going to give them names. So I'm going to use call names and row names. We've been doing this, but also name names for the standard deviations. And they all have the same names. And that's really important, this names one, because this is how those this function's going to match. Okay. So you do core to covariance, put in the correlations, and then the standard deviation. And it does all the work for you. Very cool. So now we have a covariance matrix. And because I have the covariance matrix, I can look at the unstandardized and the standardized solution. Right. So we'll build a one-factor model. So that implies that IQ here is measured, manifested, indicated, reflected in these four items, five items. All right. So we're measuring this global IQ factor, but through, represented through these five <clears throat> different measurement scales. To define a reflexive latent variable, we'll do equals tilde because that um, essentially kind of says, build me a latent, a reflective latent. Okay, so it's approximated by. So remember, one tilde is a regression. So this is like y is approximated by x. Uh, equals tilde is latent, um, predicts these y's. Oh, so here it is on here. Uh, tilde can be interpreted as y is predicted by x. Equals tilde is x is indicated by y's. Okay, so we've got our model built. So the rules, build the model, analyze the model. For this, we're gonna use the CFA function. Now this actually practically doesn't matter in Levon, but it's very nice because like, you know, <laughs> just like that it's the CFA function. It is the same basic arguments as the SEM function with a couple of uh, additional kind of ones that you could also pass to SAM. So there's actually three different ones in Levon. There's like Levon function, which I almost never use, CFA and SAM. And you can put in the same arguments for, for each one. But I think it's nice that it's CFA, because we're making it clear what we're doing. Um, put in the name of the model. For this case, we have a covariance and the number of observations. If we had the data, we just say data equals. And this is actually a default. So std.lv for standardized on the latent variable, you can set that to true if you want. But I'm going to argue that except for one or two specific models that we'll cover, never do this. Because if I set it to true, I can't see the unstandardized solution. If I leave it as false, I can see both. And I am a big fan of seeing both because <laughs> that will also help you understand um, any error messages that you get. Because if it's in the scale of the original data and you know the data is one to five and the, the unstandardized solution is 87, there's something wrong. In the standardized solution, you may never, never see that particular problem. Okay, build, analyze, summarize. So we wanna check for a couple things. Is the solution allowed, allowable, any good? No, well, that's fit in the season. I don't have a good word here. Logical might work. First thing to check for, are there, the variance is all positive. Are the squared multiple correlations, that's R squared, and the correlation correlations between um, uh, latent variables in this case, uh, are they equal to or less than one? So if we're over one, that's no good. There were no error messages. Cool. The standard errors are not huge. There were standard errors in the scale of the data, so huge may vary here, but you don't want them to be very large. Or negative, excuse me. Um, estimates. So this is more of a like, can I even look at the output that has happened? If any of those things are true, the answer is no. There's not like one part of the model that's okay, but this negative variance is not okay, but the rest of the model is okay. No, no, no. If any of these are true, 
then the model is not allowed. So what I don't I don't guess I have a problem with the way Levon is written for this, but it is very easy to miss a a warning or an error message. I think they've made it better, and then just assume that the output that it gives you is acceptable. Okay. If a model doesn't converge, none of the numbers are even lookable. Like you can look at them, don't. So I'll just like big big stop here. If any of these things are true, stop and fix the model. Don't look at the numbers in the sense of for reporting purposes. If everything is okay, then we can move on to our estimates. Do the questions load appropriately? Meaning at some specific criterion level. Then we can look at model fit. So what do those fit indices tell us? Because remember, we can have models with great simple structure with no fit. Can we improve model fit if we want to without overfitting, without adding so many parameters that it becomes meaningless? And then let's try that. What are the rules? Uh, build, analyze, summarize are three main summarizing options that we're interested that we usually always put in there. So let's look. Are our variances positive? They come down here. Yay, they're all positive. Are our correlations, we only have we don't have any of those, are r squareds less than 1? Yep. Check. Uh were there any error messages? Nope. Our CFA we would have seen it here. Are our standard errors huge? I'm going to look at all of them for here. So our latent variables, variances, all this. SE section? Nope. All right. Okay. And this, I don't remember the scale of the data, to be totally honest with you, but, you know, there's not one that's like 5,000. So we're good. All of those things are okay. So we can move on to our loadings. I'm going to come over here to standardized all because that puts it in that scale of like correlation so I can understand. And they're all above 0.3. Now I could also look at the p values here, but these are often personally fairly meaningless because um, the size of these models tends to, like the number of participants I have to have, to make one of these things appropriate to interpret, um, leads to very small standard errors which leads to really big z-scores. <laughs> and so um, the sample size tends to make everything significant. And so I, I usually have to have something in my head of what size I'm looking for. And I'm going to stick with 0.3. It's a nice medium correlation. Right? So that looks good. They all seem to load. Now model fit. Let me scroll up. A couple ways I can look at model fit here, but all the big four on my screen already, so uh, CFI and TLI, both good, both in the excellent range. Down here in RIMC is acceptable. And my SRMR is also in the excellent range. So this is some made up data and a pretty good model. Now what are some other things that I can do? And let's talk about uh, the last, but certainly not least, uh, version of standardization. In my head, it's Knox. It just makes me laugh. Knox. I don't. I don't know why that is amusing, but it's funny. Um, this is another version of standardization that you will only see in this parameter estimates function output. So parameter estimates here will give you this nice, pretty table version of the parameters. Okay, so you put in the um, model, saved model. Uh, and I did standardized equals true, uh, so I also got the standardized piece. We scroll down a little bit. And so let me just talk about this table first, and we'll talk about more about standardized on the um, exogenous variables. Um, <clears throat> so in one of these tables, what we'll always this is the section I'm really wanting to focus on is LHS, OP, and RHS. So LHS here stands for left-hand side, and that is literally the one on the left side of the equals or the tilde when you write the model code. So everything here is Levon code. OP stands for operator. Okay, so these first ones are our factor loadings. These double tildes are our variances, variances or covariances. 
And notice here that this is information covariated with information. Okay, that's variance. When you covariate with itself, it turns out to be the variance. So these are our error variances, and this is our latent variable variance. Right hand side here is literally the things on the right hand side. And the nice part about this output is if you wanted to like, um, this is more important for modification indices, but if you wanted to look at any of these particular paths by themselves, you could cut and paste this into your model. All right, because this is just the model we rewritten. Estimate here is the unstandardized solution, standard error, Z, P. This is also the only place you'll see the confidence interval. The confidence interval is done on the unstandardized estimate. So lower and upper. Standardized on our latent variable only. Standardized completely on the latent variable and the manifest variables variance. Now back to standardized NOx. Okay. So notice these two are the same, and you'll see why in a second. So uh, standardized NOx is where these estimates are based on the variances of the continuous observed and latent variables but not the variances of any exogenous covariates. We don't have any exogenous covariates. Okay, we have one exogenous variable and it's that latent variable. So this it tends to only vary when you have a fully a full sim, which we'll get to in a couple of weeks, where we have other variables that are per, yet, um, exogenous only. So it's sort of an interesting standardization where um, those other exogenous variables are excluded. And this output is the best way to get our confidence intervals for each parameter if that's important to you. Some other new functions, we can look at the <clears throat> fitted solution. So remembering when we talked about fit indices, I said that most of the fit indices are this discrepancy or match of the original covariance matrix to the reproduced covariance matrix, and you just like laying them on top of each other, how much do they match? Or for residual statistics, how much do they mismatch? And it feels very pie in the sky to talk about a reproduced covariance matrix, because the data is, right, this is the covariance matrix. Well, um, remember that your model is generating what it would have predicted the covariance matrix to be. And so your residuals are your mismatch. Just like in a linear regression, you're predicting someone's score, you may not get it exactly right. And so that's actually what the fitted function will tell you. It tells you the uh, predicted variances down the diagonal and the covariances on the off diagonal, because um, that's what a covariance matrix is. And then here is the actual covariance matrix. And so this model is a good model because information was estimated at 904, it actually was 906. 6551, 6566, so it's very close. So our fit indices indicate a pretty good model because the reproduced correlation matrix is very close to the actual covariance matrix. Covariance and covariance, sorry. I don't ever really do a whole lot with this. I just think it's, um, you, one, you can get it, but also, too, to go back to, like, what is, what is a fit indice actually doing? Okay, where is that chi-square coming from? And it's the distinction between the two matrices. Here. And then let me see if I zoom out. This will line up. There we go. So we can also look at all of the fit statistics. There are so many. So a couple weeks ago, we covered, like, CFI, TLI, IFI, RNI. NNFI, NFI, NFI, NNFI, because there's so many of them. Um, and then I was like, mainly just look at the output on the summary sheet. But if you want any of the other ones, you can print them all out at once. And so this is where um, other things are hitting, like AIC, ECVI that we use, but also GFI and AGFI, which I told you not to use, right? There's like four different versions of SRMR. And so these are ones which you might have to go hunting for, for that one pesky reviewer. And this is how you find it. Let me make this back to a little bit larger so it's readable. The best piece here is going to be our modification indices, and we use this a lot this semester. 
So we went over these before, but what is a modification in a C, just as a reminder? And what it is, is like the, the output here will show you every possible path that you could add. So paths that don't exist already that could exist. And then tells you how much the chi-square value will decrease if that path is added. Because more paths always tend to decrease chi-square because you're getting a better fit because you're having more ways to estimate that covariance matrix better. Okay. And so MI here is the modification in the C, and that is literally how much chi-square will go down if you add this path. EPC is the expected parameter, that's the unstandardized solution, that's the standardized solution, standardized solution, standardized solution. So these three here are what you might expect that path to be given different standardizations. Now, this is why we covered left-hand side and right-hand side. Let's say matrix reasoning and picture concepts. Does that make sense to add together? Maybe. Okay. And so if so, I could copy this directly, control C, paste this into my model, control V on a new line, and then rerun the model. Now, here I've got the information about what's happening to chi-square and the predictors, but then I have to look at what that did to my fit indices. And so like this last one doesn't make a whole lot of sense to add because it's very small, but maybe this first one does. Practically those two scales are very similar, that idea. <clears throat> now what you should always do these one at a time because you never know what's going to break your model. Additionally, these are only valid, the numbers here, for one at a time. It may be that after you add that first one, the rest of them disappear. Um, since these numbers represent chi-square, remember the Lagrange multiplier, anything that's 3.84 is significant at P less than 0 0.05. But in general, I would say that I would want something that like improves my model substantially. Does this model need improving? Probably not. We're already pretty good on all of our fit indices. Now something new we can do with diagramming the model, I'm gonna add a couple things here. So we're gonna use the standardized solution. What here? Now what um, changes the thickness of the lines based on their strength, okay, based on the STD here. And so the thickest line will be anything at one, but then you'll see that the lines change sort of boldness based on the strength of the path, and then kind of the reverse down here. So obviously, if I have a strong path, they'll have less error because I'm measuring it better. That kind of and then I could also color them. So I made them blue. Now, why the color here? I think the color is really useful if you have to print a model that is way bigger, or more complex than this one, and it's really hard to read all the little bitty numbers the um, bolding and coloring can really just pop out, like make it easier to see kind of right away which paths are the best. Those visualizations are worth more than tables of parameter estimates, personally. All right, so that's a one-factor model. Let's now try a two-factor model. So we only have two items on this latent variable, and so practically we should do this on the bottom. What? What I'm just going to do here is actually cheat. <laughs> and I just, as a reminder for those who are doing the homework, um, this is the solution. When you get an identification error um, and you only have two latents, you just put some sort of text in front of them. Now, that text cannot be something in your data frame, right? So don't multiply that by some other column in the data frame. It will not be happy with you. So just an A here to set them both to A. A will get estimated and they'll be estimated as the same thing. So don't set them both to like six because then it will literally set them to six. Now, the only real rule to get multiple um, latent variables is to hit enter. Okay. So each new vari latent variable should be on a new line. Just like with our regressions, each regression should be on a new line. Now you could do V equals information, V equals similarities, V equals word reasoning, and it will treat it practically identical to how I have it written here. It's just a little bit easier to say it's all three of these added together. 
So build the model, analyze the model, part two. So we all we've done here is change this to model two. Summarize the model. So let's go through our steps. Are all of the variances positive? Check are all the square squared SMCs or R squareds and correlations less than one? Check. And then we look over here under standardized all, right? This is four, but that's covariance. So here we have um, the correlation between the two variables. Now, that's really high. At 0.8, you are talking there basically the same variable. So practically, should I have a two-factor model? I don't know. I, I would be hard, it would be hard to convince me that two variables correlated at 0.8 should be separate somehow. You'd have to have a very compelling something <laughs> to suggest that these should stay separate because the simpler solution is always better. They're probably all the same factor. Uh, okay, I did the first two. No error messages, last one. No huge standard errors. And uh, not really. They're all pretty much in the right expected range. Uh, now, do they load on their latent variables? Yeah, and our loadings do seem to go up. These kind of seem to function together a little bit better. And so do they all load? Now, what about our fit indices? Our CFI TLF, TLI are also still really good. Now, some this has gone up a little bit too, but adding more paths will almost always increase your model unless it's just totally nonsensical. Um, and then some, remember that some of these fit indices penalize you for more of them. Our room C has gone down. So it's it's in the good range now, and our SMR, SRMR is also good. So this is a good fitting model as well. Now I colored it pink, and then later have realized that pink is not a good option. But just in case you wanted to see that pink is not a good option, it's just too light. Um, this color here can also be like hex color code, so you could go to town and make it you know bright lime green if you wanted. This should adhere to, you know, your kind of good visualization principles and pink is not a good option, but I can see that, you know, the F here for fluid and visual um, are, um, fluid, is that what it would be? I don't even remember. I just have an F. I think it's visual and fluid intelligence. Um, they're really highly correlated, but the fluid ones are a little, le they load a little less. And then last but not least, just like before, we can compare models. These two models are nested, so I could use that ANOVA. And um, we see that that gives us a significant difference between the models where the second model is better, because it has the lower chi-square, and it also has a lower AIC, but not by a lot. And so, you know, we'd have to think about, are these, is that improvement to the model worth it? the first model is pretty good. In my in this case, I would say no, because the correlation between latent variables is so high that it would be hard to say these are two distinct things. You're like, mm, I don't know about that. Um, <clears throat> there's another type of model that we could use instead, but in this case, I would say that they're probably similar enough that I'm not sure that this addi additional fit really is very convincing. Now, in other models, that will not be true. They would be very convincing because the fit would drop, a, would uh, improve by a lot. So there's kind of a lot of factors to take in here. Um, so I don't, you shouldn't always argue based just on fit. It should be the whole package, right? The fit is improved. The model, you know, clearly now distinguishes between X and Y and yada, yada, yada. So you have to kind of build this whole argument to why one model is better than the other, especially in this case, because they're pretty they're pretty close. And there are some rules for like how much better for AIC or how much better for CFI. And we'll get to the CFI ones uh, later. But um, I would say they're they suffer from the same problems that P less than 0.05 has, right? that there, there might be good rules of thumb, but you really have to think about what it means in the broader context of whatever you're trying to model. 
Now, something cool that got added, oh man, um, I one day was on Twitter, which is, you know, but it provided me these amazing moments where we started talking about how to tidy up these outputs, which is like a dream come true. Thank you, Twitter friends. Uh, how to tidy this output, like how to make it printable. And so two options. One of them is in the easy stats package. There's more than two, but here's two right now. Um, and the easy stats package, this is one of my new favorite things. It has a, it's a easy stats is like a, a collection of packages, just like tidy versus a collection of packages. It has a specific one called parameters that is actually specifically meant for Levon output. Um, I think it does more than this, but it has a Levon piece. And so you do model underscore parameters. You put in the name of the model and what if you want the standardized or the unstandardized solution. And it actually will give you the confidence interval for the standardized solution. So that's really exciting. Um, that also makes me a nerd. It prints this out in markdown format. So when you, when you like convert this from, from markdown, that is a table. This is how tables are printed. Uh, and so it prints you a nice pretty table. I don't know that I call this link here, but this is the path. All right, so it prints the left-hand side and the right-hand side and prints the, the loadings in nice, pretty, like a kind of APA format. Uh, and I would use this if I was just like converting to Markdown. So another option is Broom. I think um, Broom has so many cool things in it. And the function is tidy. What that does is it creates you a tibble. I don't love tibbles, but can, you can convert that to a data frame of all of the paths. And so here it actually prints the um, covariances as well. This one doesn't because you generally don't report those. Okay. This is the sort of section you report, right? But if I wanted all of them, let's say for sorting or filtering purposes, this is really, really fantastic. Um, and we'll get later into what you might need to sort for. Um, so tidy will create you this nice kind of data frame of, of all of your parameter estimates. Or if you if you um, save the parameter estimates output, that'll also you can convert into a data frame. Um, where was I going with this? Uh, glance here is another option, and glance will throw all of the fit indices into a, a table for you. That's cool if you have like ten different models that you're trying to all put together into one fit indices table. You could glance them all together. Those are all the new things I've learned this semester. So let's create a summary. In this lecture, what have we learned? Well, we talked about simple confirmatory factor analysis, building a measurement model with one latent variable, with two latent variables, and how to view a bunch of stuff we haven't really looked at before, which is our parameter estimates and the ways to clean those up, quantification indices, fit measures, and the fitted covariance matrix. We practice building those models, so now you get to go on and build your own latent variables with equals tilde. And then last, we talked about some tidy output options for printing out pretty reports. So that covers our basics of CFA. In the next section, we'll get into hierarchical models, and then we'll have a week covering fully structural models to finish out our kind of CFA section.